Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our event tonight, a dialogue on sport, protest, and the NFL national anthem debate. My name is Edmund Santuri. I'm professor of religion and philosophy at St. Olaf College and the Morrison family director of the St. Olaf College Institute for Freedom and Community, the institute sponsoring our event tonight. The purpose of St. Olaf's Institute for Freedom and Community is to encourage free inquiry and meaningful debate of important political and social issues by exploring diverse ideas about politics, markets, and society. The Institute aims to challenge presuppositions, question easy answers, and foster constructive dialogue among those with differing values and contending points of view. The Institute offers a distinctive opportunity to cultivate civil discourse about contentious issues in a liberal arts setting. Thanks to all who helped organize our event tonight. Special thanks to Institute Administrative Assistant Shannon Regeer, Institute Assistant Director Greg Seams, St. Olaf Vice President of Enrollment and College Relations Michael Kyle, Associate Director of Marketing Carrie Vanderveen, Director of Broadcast and Media Services Jeff O'Donnell, and St. Olaf alum Justice Sam Hansen. Thanks also to Andrea Galswick of Marketing and Communications, Brian Jans of Events Management, and Chris Moore, former uh, Institute Assistant Director for Help. Finally, thanks to the students and professors from a range of courses currently in session at St. Olaf. Students in these courses will be participating tonight in a special way, as we'll see in a bit. We have a distinguished panel with us tonight to discuss our topic. Their accomplishments are legion, widely known and outlined in detail on the Institute website. But to introduce our guests briefly here, first, Justice Alan Page, who certainly needs no introduction in these parts, is a retired justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court. He served on the court for 22 distinguished years. He was the first African American to serve on the court and one of the first associate justices elected rather than appointed to the court. Justice Page did some other work earlier in his life. He was a great defensive tackle for the Minnesota Vikings. Indeed, the only defensive lineman ever named NFL MVP, and one elected eventually to the NFL Hall of Fame. With his wife Diane, Justice Page in 1988 established the Page Education Foundation, which provides economic support and mentoring for students of color in exchange for volunteer community service. And with his daughter, Cammie, he has written two children's books, the proceeds for which go to the Page Education Foundation. Next, Jackie McMullen is an award-winning sports writer who has written for, among other outlets, Sports Illustrated and the Boston Globe, has authored a number of best-selling books on and with nationally significant sports figures, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, Shaquille O'Neal, Gino Auriemma, and she currently works as an ESPN analyst and columnist. She was the first woman to appear on the ESPN show Around the Horn some years ago, and can still be seen on that show with some of the leading sports journalists in the country in lively conversation on current issues in the world of sport. In 2010, she was the winner of the Kurt Gowdy Media Award given by the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame for outstanding basketball writing and broadcasting. Most recently, she interviewed and wrote about Boston Celtic basketball great Bill Russell on his decision to support athletes protesting during the national anthem. In her piece, she provides an account of Russell's significance as a premier activist in the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. Finally, we have with us Nate Boyer. Nate is a former U.S. Army Green Beret and former player for the University of Texas and Seattle Seahawks football teams. He served for six years in the military, including a number of tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. Given convictions born of his experience, Nate has expressed the preference that Americans stand during the playing of the national anthem. But he wrote a letter to Colin Kaepernick, a letter which helped persuade Kaepernick to kneel rather than sit during the latter's protest. And eventually, Nate stood with Kaepernick when Kaepernick took a knee for the first time during the playing of the national anthem at an NFL game. And just last October, 
Nate wrote an open letter to every single American, his, his phrase, including President Trump, Kaepernick, and Nate's, quote, brothers in arms overseas, end of quote, calling for reconciliation across political divides. Would you please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel tonight? Just a few remarks to set a context for our conversation tonight. I take it that many of you are familiar, at least in large outline, with the chronology of events that informs this recent debate about political protest during the playing of the national anthem at NFL games. In August of 2016, Colin Kaepernick, then quarterback of the San Francisco 49ers, sat in protest during the playing of the anthem before a preseason game. In explaining his action, Kaepernick said, and I quote, I am not going to stay up to show, uh, stand up excuse me, to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color, end of quote. Kaepernick's action elicited almost immediate public response, some positive, some negative, including the fierce criticism of President Trump. Then in September 2016, Kaepernick decides to kneel rather than sit during the anthem with Nate Boyd and another NFL player. Some athletes and management figures inside and outside the NFL show support for Kaepernick in various ways, kneeling, locking arms, or remaining in the locker room during anthem playing. Other athletes continue to stand with a hand over heart. One, a former West Pointer and U.S. Army Ranger, doing so after cutting away from his team, still in the locker room. He later expresses regret for breaking ranks with his team. During this time, the larger public seems divided on the issue. Some support Kaepernick, others find him spoiled, ungrateful, and disrespectful. Still others acknowledge the merit of his protest against racial discrimination, but prefer he find another way to make his point. Eventually, Kaepernick opts out of his 49er contract. He was about to be cut by the team. Though he says at one point that he would stand for the anthem in the future, no other NFL team signs him even as many concede he's good enough to be playing. Rumors surface that NFL teams are conspiring to keep him out of the league. The rumors are denied. Kaepernick files a grievance against the NFL for collusion among owners to prevent his hiring. In the meantime, some athletes inside and outside the NFL at different points, uh, at different levels of sport, continue the protest in Kaepernick's uh, absence. At one point, NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell expresses the view that players should stand during the anthem. The team owners and the coaches themselves express varying attitudes. There is a drop in NFL TV ratings. Some analysts attribute the drop to anger over the protests, though others claim there are better explanations for the drop in ratings. For example, the growing public aversion to NFL football violence and debilitating injury, or the boredom of seeing the New England Patriots again and again in the playoffs. <laughs> That's just a joke. I'm, actually, I, I like the Patriots. <laughs> Regarding the, the appropriate, <laughs> regarding the appropriateness of standing, kneeling, sitting, what have you, during the anthem, most polls show that the nation remains deeply divided on the matter. What is it exactly that divides the nation? Perhaps what divides is a set of competing values that, interestingly enough, are invoked by the national anthem itself. As you all know, the last line of the first verse of the Star Spangled Banner characterizes this country as the land of the free and the home of the brave. And it seems to me that that line may capture in an efficient way some of the competing values and meanings at the heart of the controversy. What do we mean by freedom? And whose freedom are we talking about? Francis Scott Key, the author of the anthem's lyrics, certainly thought of the nation as free in the sense that it was a democratic republic, free from British imperial tyranny. Alas, he himself was an owner of slaves. So it's clear that by freedom, he didn't mean freedom in a sense most, I hope everyone would embrace today. But setting aside that irony, freedom in the American political tradition has also been associated with a discrete set of particular freedoms, including freedom of speech and the right to protest. Somewhere I read, Martin Luther King said powerfully in his very last speech in Memphis before he was killed. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right, end of quote. 
In this spirit, Kaepernick should be supported and celebrated, even if it is conceded, as most constitutional scholars do concede, that his protest is constitutionally protected by the First Amendment only against government coercion, but not against employer sanction. Indeed, there are those who argue that among the discrete freedoms protected by the American political system is within limits the freedom to do with one's property or business as one sees fit. So if NFL owners want to fire protesting players or refuse to employ them because they think that's best for their business, that's their right. They have that freedom in this land of the free, or so the argument goes. But the anthem, anthem celebrates the nation not only as the land of the free, but also as the home of the brave. Those who show courage in defense of the nation, and particularly those who put their lives on the line in sacrifice to the nation in order to defend the land of the free. And standing in a respectful pose during the playing of the national anthem is for many Americans a way of honoring what is the sacred sacrifice of the fallen soldier. Indeed, to fail to honor in this way is seen by many as a desecration a violation of the terms of the American civil religion, or at least as deeply unpatriotic or as ingratitude of the highest order. All of this, of course, is controversial. Others will argue that the protest against racial inequity and injustice is precisely to honor the values for which the soldier sacrifices. There are many other issues raised by this controversy, but enough said in the way of preface. We're going to proceed as follows. Uh, each member of the panel will have about five minutes of opening remarks. Once those o opening remarks are given, then there will be roughly another uh, half hour or so of intra-conversation within the panel, and then once we've completed that, we'll entertain uh, Q&A. Uh, so, to begin, Justice Page. Well, um, that introduction leaves a lot to um, a lot to chew on my reaction and my reaction to this whole issue is that um, in the end it's really not about the flag it's really not about the anthem not about the First Amendment it's about justice. And the question is, it seems to me, what is more important? Ensuring that equal justice is available to all of our citizens, all of our people, not just citizens, everybody here, or the symbol of um, honoring that f the flag. In the end, for me, it's about justice. And you're you're right that um, the First Amendment, for the most part, doesn't apply here. Although um, I think it gets implicated, not maybe not fully, but implicated when the President of the United States not just comments on the question, but comments in a way that could be construed as coercive to the owners. And the owners do have the right to do as they choose, except to, the, except to the extent that they have collectively bargained that right away. And um, so th there, there's a lot going on. <laughs> and um, I guess I, I will close my sort of opening remarks with a, a quote from Paul Robeson. What he said was, the answer to injustice is not to silence the critic. It is to end the injustice. Thank you. So you bring up a very interesting point. Somewhere along the way, 
we've forgotten what Colin Kaepernick was protesting in the first place, and that was police brutality and racial injustice, two things that absolutely exist in our culture still, in our communities, and that was his intent. Now, as so often happens in our world today, people seize hold of an image, and I understand it. I grew up in a family where when even we were watching a game on television, we all put our hand over our hearts when they played the national anthem. That's the family I grew up in. My father's a veteran. Uh, I believe very strongly. I used to, when you see protests are burning the American flag, it used to be the most horrific thing I ever saw. But we, we have to get past that to understand where Kaepernick is coming from. Now, I will say this. Colin Kaepernick, who I've interviewed, and I find to be a very serious, thoughtful young man, he had some missteps in his message. Uh, he wore some socks, you guys know what I'm talking about, with pigs on it, representing the police. That muddied his message, I think. I think it turned people away from his message. Um, I bet if he could do that over, he would not do that again. But let's get back to, again, what he was protesting. Um, Justice Page is right. It wasn't about the flag, and yet I understand the outcry because the flag is such a strong symbol of our country, what it means to us, what it means to each one of you individually, especially if, as Nate did, if you served your country, which I have not. So I understand the ambiguity. Ambiguity. I didn't say that right. Ambiguity. Thank you. <laughs> ambiguity. I've been here too long. <laughs> Uh, and I find it a very fascinating thing. What, and then I'll, I'll let Nate speak next. But the one thing I keep looking at when I, when I look at this, this whole incident was what if the NFL hadn't been what, what it always has been, and that is reactionary? What if just once the NFL was proactive in the way they approached this? And uh, I think that's part of the problem also. I think there was too little too late on behalf of the National Football League to get a foothold on this issue and, uh, and to have dialogue with their players, which I think would have changed a lot of things. And uh, I think if they had, could have a do-over, they would have been a little more proactive the moment this incident came to light. Um, so uh, I, you know, I served my country, uh, went overseas a number of times, and through my, my time in service and deployments, and um, actually the, the intro was almost right. So I served 10 years, actually. Sorry. It's okay. Everybody says six. I served six on active duty first. And then my four years while I was back at college at the University of Texas, um, I served in the Texas National Guard and I actually would deploy every summer while I was in school. And so I'd go back over to Afghanistan and, and then come home and go to class and play football and do all that stuff. And as the years went on, from 2011 through, through 2014, every year I came back, I came back to a country that felt more and more uh, divided and at odds uh, and less and less interested in what we were doing over there. <laughs> and it was frustrating to to go fight for you know for fight for those that can't fight for themselves in those parts of the world but also uh to fight for these ideals that we we hold here and um and the freedoms that you know the flag and the anthem are supposed to represent um but to come back to a, a country that's you know facing this you know civil war of on social media <laughs> and uh it's you know it's hurtful and and then uh yeah thing you know things have are progressing along. It's a, yeah, I had a very, very brief career uh, with the Seahawks, and, and that ends. And um, let me get to that next season. And, uh, you know, Colin Kaepernick is sitting on the bench during the anthem, and everybody's talking about it, and we're in the mid middle of this election cycle, um, a more divided election than I've ever been alive for anyway. Um, and... I had, a, you know, publications reaching out to me asking if I would write an, an opinion piece about this whole thing. And to me, I thought that was the worst thing I could possibly do is uh, give my opinion on why he should do something or why he shouldn't do something uh, because that's exactly what everybody else was doing and that's why we were banging heads. 
So I told them, no, I'm not going to do that. And, uh, they persisted. And I eventually, I, I wrote, uh, I wrote an open letter. I agreed to write an open letter to Colin explaining my experience, uh, what I've, you know, done in my life and my relationship to the flag and the anthem. And, but also that I was willing to listen to his and I wanted to understand where he was coming from and what he was feeling and how can I help that situation. When I go over to Iraq and Afghanistan, when we go over as a military, the goal is not to go over there and, and uh, as many people may think this, but <laughs> the goal of a, of, an, of a military member is not to go over there and, and instill uh, your values or your will on the other people. I mean, it's to, especially in the special forces, it's to free the oppressed. That's our motto. And so I wrote all that in this letter and um, it was published in the Army Times, which nobody reads. Nobody in the Army Times. <laughs> nobody in the Army reads the Army Times. Trust me. <laughs> uh, but many people like, like Jackie and, and, and people in, in, you know, in her profession, especially in the sports world, because I'd spent this time, I started to share it. You know? And by the end of the day, it was this viral thing. And I had all these news agencies reaching out. And um, I didn't want to go on Fox or CNN or MSNBC or any of these things because – Anymore these days, there's like this, you know, there's such a, it's such an, a, an opinion uh, based around that. Like if, if I show up on one of those channels, everybody assumes that's the team I'm playing for. Or that's, you know, and that's not what I'm about. I was, I'm as in the middle as you could possibly imagine. And uh, so I said no to them and I said yes to uh, the NFL network because it's a sports channel and um, I knew some of the people there and. And I'm getting ready to go on and do this interview about this deal. And Colin Kaepernick calls me. Um, and I've never talked to him before. You know, I grew up a 49er fan and it was, it was interesting. And, you know, he said he wanted to sit down and have a conversation and meet about this whole deal. So the next day I didn't talk about it on the interview. And the next day I drove down to San Diego and met him in the team hotel before the game. Um, and we talked about both of our experiences and, um, and it was a friendly, civil conversation, you know. And I could tell he was a very sensitive guy, and he was uh, he was open minded, and he wanted to he wanted to listen, um, and he wanted to maybe demonstrate in a different way. And through that conversation, um, he, he agreed to take a knee instead of sit that day. And um, I stayed next to him on the sideline there, and uh, that sort of you know took off. Um, and in my opinion, you know. We need more of those conversations. I, I wish, when we talk about some of my personal opinions on Colin's missteps, I wish he would have more of those conversations and he would have continued to be more outspoken around the issues and, and, and do what a lot of these other players are doing in the league, which is meet with local authorities and you know, kids in and, and a lot of these communities uh, where a lot of that, that treatment doesn't, doesn't feel like it's, uh, like it's fair. And anyway, that's where we're at now. But okay. yeah, that's a little background on my Thank situation. Nate, you did um, convince him, I take it, or contributed to his change. Yeah, I don't want to say convince. Okay, it was but a you mutual, contributed. Yeah. Can you give us some sense of how that conversation went? Yeah, you know, it was uh, one of the things I did was I showed him messages from people I served with. Some of them were very upset. Some of them were. Um, interested to see this was where this was going. You know, not everybody that served in the military was offended. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the rights that we all fought for, whether we agree with them or not, and we have every right to disagree, are ultimate freedoms to of expression, of speech, um, uh, to do exactly what he was doing. I mean, I, f I fought for the people that burned the flag. You know, I don't like it, but that's what I fought for. You can't, you can't, in a lot of other parts of this world you do that and you, you don't survive the day you know and that's uh, that's what's special about this place and and very unique and so we talked about that um we talked about i, I sh one of the messages was from a, a buddy of mine who lost both his legs uh fighting for our country and you know he said tell colin even though i i don't have legs i'll stand with enough pride for both of us when the anthem is played and that's, mm. that's a tough one. I mean, you know, that's a different perspective. And I showed Colin that, and it affected him. He cared. He, he didn't blow that off, you know. He asked me, how can I 
what can I do to still to demonstrate, but to not hurt someone like that? And I said, well, um, I think if you're willing to show that you, you're, you're willing to adjust in some way for people like that and, and explain where that's coming from, I think that would go a long way. And I think, you know, if you want people to listen to you just like it is in life, you need to listen to them. And, uh, and you know, when I, I talked about, it, I think it's important to acknowledge that like relating to the, the socks, you know, not all cops are bad. Most cops are really good and most of them do a really good job, right. but, and it, it, it's the same in the military. We have guys in our line of work that, and girls, people that make mistakes and it's, I, I hate it when it happens, you know, and they make bad decisions and, uh, they maybe shouldn't have been, they didn't get the proper training and they shouldn't have been in that situation. And, you know, at the end of the day, I, I'm not going to paint a broad stroke, just like I wouldn't, you know, gen, I don't want to generalize against anybody. And so generalizing against police officers is the very thing you're fighting. And I, and he not only understood that, he thought that was, you know, very, uh, important to recognize. So that, that night after the game, actually, he didn't wear a Fidel Castro shirt or a Malcolm X hat. He wore 49ers gear <laughs> and he talked uh, about all that stuff. And I think one of the reasons, and I was talking about this at dinner, one of the reasons that I'm not going to say he went backwards in any way, but you know, the decision not to vote and, and, and some of these other things that he's done. Imagine being in his position and you've got people on one side of this deal, you know, pulling you in their direction as hard as they can, you know, and, and, and showing you positivity and support if you continue to push their agenda. And people on the other side, they just hate you and spew ugly stuff. Of course, you're going to gravitate towards that. You know, it's really hard to maintain that sort of that, that middle spot. So I get it. Like, and I, I don't blame him for anything um, because I understand where how that, I, I don't understand, but I can, I can only imagine what that must feel like and how that must be, how difficult that must be to be in that situation. Yeah. Thank you. So one of the things I found interesting was um, Colin made his stand. Players were, some players were sympathetic, some players were silent, some players didn't agree. But it wasn't until um, President Trump at that rally in Alabama started talking about these players should be fired and, you know, and it was that next week that there were 100 players in the NFL that stayed in their locker room or sat. In some cases, Marshawn Lynch sat, I think, the rest of the year. Some raised their fist, some kneeled, some linked arms. So it was the president that set off these players, not their own, not their own player, not their own brother, if you will. It was the president in response to the president where this thing really started to gain some momentum. And that's why I mention um, the NFL and their reaction to it because um, you had a lot of NFL owners. I forgot. I, at one point, I was counting them all who voted for Trump, not only voted for Trump, but donated millions of dollars to President Trump. So now they have a problem on their hands too, don't they? Uh, how they feel politically, how they feel personally about their team, their players, their league, if you will. And so that's when I, I started getting... The, the messages were so mixed. Jerry Jones, for instance, of the Dallas Cowboys agreed to link arms and kneel with his team, but only before the anthem was played. He was upright. All of them were by the time the anthem was played. And then the next week told all his players, you better get back to work, all right? I did that, thing, that little thing with you, and now you all get back to work, and I'm not going to tolerate this anymore. What is that message? What is that message? So this is some of the problems I have with the NFL. Uh, just last month, uh, they've been, there's been dialogue between players and the NFL, and I give the NFL credit for that. It's, let's all get on the same page. That's the idea. It just took too long. <laughs> right. It's taking too long. And they did um, offer $100 million, $25 million to the United Negro Fund, $25 million to Dream Corps. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Dream Corps. I was not before I read about this, and it's an organization that really tries to help America grow stronger together. And then the other $50 million would have been for an ad hoc um, group of players coalition to mete out how they saw fit if they all stood for the national anthem. So I ask you, is it a bribe? Should they take it anyway because it's going to help dialogue and help uh, organizations that are um, are important to a, a league that is, I think, I don't know what the um, breakdown of, of African Americans in the NFL, but it's pretty high. 
So what do you, I'm just curious what you think. Is it a bribe or is it a, a genuine offer? If you're the players, what do, you, what do you do? The players rejected it, by the way. I just am curious what any of you think. Can they answer me? I know it's not question uh, and answer uh, yet, but well, we'll I, get to I it afterwards. Like, I would okay. like to give Justice Page an opportunity to... Well, <clears throat> I think the only thing I would add is the, the point that um, sometimes gets lost, but I think everybody sort of touched on it. Is we've got to stop yelling at each other and start listening to each other. Because as long as we're yelling, we're not learning anything. When we're listening, we may have a chance to learn something. Um, and I think in, in this conversation and in a whole host of others, that we as a, we as a country are, are, should be having, um, we really do need to start listening more and yelling less. Your uh, earlier point about was a juristic point about collective bargaining. I'm wondering if, if for our group here, you could unpack that a little bit about how that affects our understanding of the issue. Well, um, boy, I didn't know I was going to have to give a course on <laughs> labor law. Uh, essentially, the the employer uh, with employees at will, or I suppose these these. Uh, Football players are under contract, but to the extent that they are employees at will, the employer can uh, fire them for any reason or no reason, so long as it's not an illegal reason. Where you uh, have a collective bargaining agreement, which the NFL does with the NFL Players Association, um, you have to comply with that agreement. And I, I quite frankly don't know whether or not they have bargained over this matter, whether it's uh, permitted or prohibited by the agreement. Um, but certainly that agreement controls to some degree what owners can and cannot do. Yeah. As I understand, there is an anti-collusion uh, element that's part of the collective bargaining agreement uh, between the Players Association and the NFL, so that the issue turns uh, on whether or not there has, in fact, been collusion. Um, uh, Colin well, Kaepernick char the col charges... Collusion as to whether or not teams have um, agreed not to hire Colin Kaepernick, right. but as to whether or not players can speak, that... That I don't know the answer to. I see what you're saying. Whether the whether the agreement covers that or not. Okay. It's interesting too. The NFL collective bargaining agreement does not st um, specifically state that players must stand for the national anthem. Uh, the NBA collective bargaining agreement specifically states players must stand for the national anthem. But again, the NBA. I'm picking on the NFL, and I'm doing it on purpose. <laughs> I am. Um, the NBA has been proactive in these situations. Uh, now, of course, they had the benefit of watching the whole Kaepernick thing unfold and everything that's gone on in this NFL season. The NBA started later. But they got ahead of it. They got their executive player, the director of the Players Association, Mel Michelle Roberts, who's just a really sharp lady. Uh, they got Adam Silver, their commissioner, and they got their president, LeBron James, uh, but Chris Paul, LeBron James, and Dwayne Wade, who are all their officers, together well in advance of all this and said, okay, let's be a united front. All of us, we all agree that you have rights and you have things. And you remember the Trayvon Martin um, statement. Remember the Miami Heat players wore their hoods. That was something they cleared with their, their player, executive player director. That's something Adam Silver knew was coming because they had dialogue about it. It goes back to what you're saying, collaborative dialogue. So they were able to make a very strong statement that I think really resonated across our country. It was done peacefully and it was done forcefully with the, the muscle of some of the greatest superstars in, our, in the NBA game. And so when the NBA season started, have you seen any protests at all regarding the national anthem? No, right? Because 
They're trying to get on the same page to try to find a collaborative way to tackle these issues. So it, was it a matter, in your view, of getting ahead of the yes, situation? Yes, proactive or as oppo it, opposed to reactive. Uh, but also, just I think just the NF, the MBA is a little more open-minded uh, about these issues. Uh, and I, so I, in some cases, I think it's there's not old school owners in the there's not as many old school there are some don't don't mistake yeah. there are some but there are a lot of mark cubans uh you know michael jordan's a minority owner in the charlotte hornets uh there's a lot of other people that are collaborating with the N nba that gives the commissioner the power to meet with these players and say hey let's we want to help you get your message out you know interestingly enough too the nfl uh, just a few days ago, AMVETS, which is a, a group of veterans, um, they, they submitted an ad, Super Bowl ad, for the Super Bowl program, and it was hashtag please stand, and the NFL rejected that ad. Yeah, they don't like uh, any message or mission. I mean, like after the, the five uh, police officers were, were murdered in Dallas, uh, that was was that last year or two years ago? I think it was two, two years ago when that you know when that yeah. active shooter that guy. Um, the da the Cowboys wanted to wear something on their helmets to recognize them, and the league said no to that as well. You know they they uh, they just don't don't do that. And I mean to that point, at least at least they're not only doing that or saying please stand and not allowing you know people who like the the shirts the NBA players were wearing mm -hmm. um I can't do breathe. that but yeah I can't breathe or the or, or hands up no shoot or, or mm -hmm. don't shoot or whatever it would be um but I, I mean I mean I wonder if you know some of that is I mean the fan base in, in for foot the NFL is is largely more conservative than the NBA right. I think for Correct. the most part so there's there's maybe some of that um if I could just j jump in on that point I was going to ask how much of this, it's widely perceived and stated that the NFL does tend to be a more conservative league, the NBA is much more liberal and so forth. So I mean, how much of the, of the reservation about how the NFL operates is a function of one's political perspective? That comes down to selling tickets at the end of the day. <laughs> I mean, I think my personal belief on the, the collusion case or the blackballing situation, I personally don't think it's a form of collusion. I think it's these individual owners making a business decision in fear of losing a large part of their fan base because of you know what we just spoke of, and that's my opinion. A lot of people disagree with that, but um, you know, I mean, I during the the time when teams were working out, Colin, uh, before this season, I had. Uh, several different organizations reached out to me and asked me about my personal opinions on Colin, what I thought from our meeting, you know, did I think he's a genuine person? And my answers were all very positive and just, you know, truthful about our conversation, much like I shared with you guys, just, that's what I said. And, you know, specifically the, the Seahawks, they, you know, they had him up there and worked him out and coach Carroll liked him. John Schneider liked him. The organization liked him. And I think it just came down to, at the end of the day, first of all, Seattle's a very military town. And it was that worry, am I going to divide my fan base? You know, I think that personally I believe that's more where it's coming from than um, this collusion. But, you know, you never know. I guess what we'll find out is that an investigation unfolds. But I'm curious just what constitutes collusion. Maybe you can help us with that because – there's no doubt in my mind if Colin Kaepernick said none of this, he would be on an NFL roster. Oh, 100%. So is that collusion? <laughs> Justice? <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things I learned a long time ago is not to form opinions without knowing the facts. Mm -hmm. And we don't know all the facts. It's true. I think we have to wait and see. I think we'll eventually find out and once the um, facts are out there, um, we can analyze them and see what the reasonable inferences to be drawn from them are. But until that happens, it's all, I suppose, an interesting conversation, but really doesn't take us very far. 
But in principle, it is possible for individual teams to have had. You know, he's pretty good. We might be able to use him on the team, but it's too much static, and it's not good for business. And this could have gone, this could have been the case going team by team without there being collusion, right? Certainly possible. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, remember now, he's, he wasn't going to be a starting quarterback anymore. And traditionally, and that's, got, uh, that's got nothing to do with a what backup happened. quarterback. Traditionally, you know, a backup quarterback is very quiet. You know, they hold the clipboard, they send in the signals, they're ready to go in case they're typically not a big personality, typically. I mean, you know, once Johnny Menzel and a lot of these guys that kind of were demoted from a starter, they disappeared from the league too. Um, not that Johnny Menzel is as good as Colin Kaepernick, in my opinion, but he did win a Heisman Trophy. Um, right. but, uh, but Colin's absolutely uh, capable, physically very capable. I mean, I think he's better than some of the starters out there too. Personally, um, interesting so. about Colin Kaepernick. Now we're really getting into football here, inside <laughs> football a little bit. But he's a different style of quarterback too. Very different. For instance, um, when the Patriots traded Jimmy Garoppolo, is everybody still over that yet? I'm not. Anyway, we could talk about that's a whole other panel. Fan. That's where the overflow room. We'll be doing that afterwards. But uh, uh, Jimmy Jesus Kaeper, Kaepernick made no sense for the Patriots because of the style of play, because of the way Colin Kaepernick plays football. So that ties into it a little bit as well. Okay. Uh, just one other question before we go to um, general Q&A. Um, again, I have in mind this issue of how much our reaction to any one of these decisions within the NFL, part of NFL management, NFL players, and so forth, is a function of where one finds oneself on the political spectrum. So when NFL commissioner... Um, said he thinks that players ought to stand up during the anthem. Do you think that was a mistake? Do you think that that was? And if it was a mistake, why was it a mistake? Was it a mistake simply because it was not a very smart thing to do given the circumstances? Or was there something morally troubling in your views about his making that statement? I mean, if he believes it personally, then... Why should he not be able to say that? In my opinion, I mean, I, I believe he's the, the commissioner, same way. though. That's why. Right, but saying should and will are very different. But I see, mean, that's what it says in the policy. But why doesn't know? he just say, you know, personally, I prefer that our players stand for the national anthem. Yet I recognize that this issue is not about the national anthem at all. It's about something else. So let's find a solution. That's the problem. We, we're you're, we're talking about this, but. Roger Goodell always deals in absolutes. And why? Because the players gave him the power to do anything he wants. He is the most powerful commissioner of all because he, they gave him all this veto power and all we've seen all the, the fines and the uh, deflate gate and uh, what was the other big one? Uh, bounty gate and all these things. So he has uh, very few checks and balances within his stratosphere, if you will. So that's... I, I, I would note that um, you sort of have to look at that in context. Unlike um, other professional leagues, the NFL, um, from its inception, the commissioner has had the power to virtually do as he will. Right, Pete Rozelle all the way back. And, and before Rozelle. Yeah. Um, and while the, the players have been able to bargain um, currently, th their, their bargaining position is a lot stronger than it used to be, but um, I wouldn't so much fault the players or quite frankly, the league. I mean, you've got the power. You're not sure. To oh, give it up. of course not. Um, and remember too, there's they, you can cut NFL players. Absolutely. They're not guaranteed contracts. That's the biggest difference between the NFL and every other professional sports league. Yeah, I mean, so that's a pretty big hammer. There, there, there are a whole host of things going on there that allows um, him to say 
and do the things he does. Quite frankly, I'm not sure that uh, saying that, you know, I think players should stand is all that big a deal. Well, they, it's not, a, it's not that big a deal they, until you've got 100 players on game day sitting, kneeling. They, well, um, I was going to say, they race. certainly weren't listening to them, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think and this is an uh, this is an important uh, note for this whole situation that the media never really talked about, um, but a lot of people that know the history of the anthem talk about it a lot, and it upsets a lot of people that that I know about you know that, that take it quite personal for whatever reasons. But um, the reason we started playing the Star Spangled Banner at sporting events um, was originally to honor the military. So the tradition started uh, in 1917 during World War I, and it was the first game of the World Series between the Boston Red Sox and the Chicago Cubs. And Babe Ruth is on the mound pitching. It's at Wrigley Field. Um, couldn't be a more American moment. <laughs> and the third baseman for the Red Sox is a guy named Fred Thompson who was in the Navy and he was granted furlough to play in the World Series. And so he's standing on third base. And back then they used to have military bands that would come to, this, come to the games, you know, to big games. And during the seventh inning stretch, the band started playing the Star Spangled Banner. And so Fred Thompson, he turns around, faces the flag, snaps to attention. And the rest of the players on the field, out of respect for him, took their hats off. And then people in the stands started singing the song, and um, it became this, like, you know, pretty powerful moment. And uh, game two rolls around, and they do it again in the seventh inning stretch. Same same reaction. And then the, the series moves to Boston, and they played it before the game, and they actually brought some uh, some wounded warriors on the field <laughs> before the game, like we do now, uh, and honored them. And it became this, like, tradition during only big games. It wasn't before every sporting event, um, but these big games, they would play the anthem. That was 1917. Well, in 1934 the Star Spangled Banner became the national anthem. So not until then. And one of the main reasons it became that was because of the popularity of it being played at these sporting events. There was other songs that were, you know, they were interested in playing and, and they chose the first verse of the Star Spangled Banner to be our national anthem. And which was, like I said, to originally honor the military. So the reason we started playing at sporting events and, and, and it became our anthem and all these things was because uh, we were honoring the military at sporting events, and, and, and they never brought that up in this whole situation. And I think that was something important. That's a very important story to me. I think it's something that should have been talked about at least um, to gain perspective for everybody involved. Um, and I, I'm not sure why it why it never came up, but I think it's interesting. And um, and the last thing I want to I want to before we open the Q and A, I want to talk about. I want to mention real quick is just in regards to our country as a whole and the the state of the union <laughs> or whatever it is right now um, is that patriotism um, is not reserved for people with conservative values. And it means very, very different things. You know, there's very many ways to, to show you're a patriot. And I think in a lot of ways, what Colin did is very patriotic. People, take offense to that and would be shocked that someone in the military would say that, but I think it is. But I also want to note that open-mindedness is not reserved for people with liberal, liberal values. And I think it's important because some of, some of the most, some of the, some people that I've discussed this issue with that are, are, are on the very far edge of the left, which I would traditionally put in, a, in an open, I would consider them to be open-minded people, have been as close-minded as you could possibly imagine to not even want to listen um, as well. And I think that's something we all have to get over and we all have to understand that those are not, <laughs> you're, you're, not a, you're not patriotic just because you think everyone should stand for the national anthem and you, know, you, you, you care about the flag and all that stuff, but you're not necessarily open-minded because um, you're a Democrat or whatever. I mean... Uh, we all need to be open-minded, and we all should be patriotic, in my opinion, in a positive way. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say that because it was on my mind; it was bothering me. So, <laughs> thank you. Good for you. I think now might be a good time to move to Q and A, um, and the way we're going to proceed, there are a couple of things. 
Uh, one is we're going to begin Q&A with the students in the particular courses that have been in conversation uh, with us about the program and invite uh, questions that come from the perspective generated in those particular courses. Uh, and so we will ask you, uh, ask the first set of questions to be from students in those classes. And then uh, secondly, could you please uh, speak into a mic that will uh, be brought to you once you are uh, recognized. And for the students in those classes, could you identify the class that you're in uh, before you pose the question? So questions. There's one here. And please direct your question to any of the panel members. Alrighty, so this is sort of to anybody, open question. Um, I'm in a poli sci 111. It's about American democracy. And we mentioned towards the beginning, I think it was um, the justice mentioned how the president shared his opinion, act created something of a First Amendment issue. And if you could sort of elaborate on what any one of you believes the role of the president and the federal government at large should be in this proceeding and this issue and the protest, how they should handle it, whether they should legislate about it, share their opinions. Well, I think legislating runs right into the First Amendment. I mean, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. So I think that's problematic. Um, you know, the president is like any other citizen. He has the right to to voice his opinion. Um, and I don't think it probably r runs into a problem until you start to get in that area where you're trying to coerce somebody to do something. Can I ask if you think that he came close to doing that? Uh, you can ask. <laughs> <laughs> You're like Patrick Ewing. I was talking to him once, and he said, no comment, but thanks for asking. <laughs> well, in, in fairness, one of the things that I learned as a young lawyer, give, taking a deposition and advising my client, answer only the question asked. And the question you asked was, can I ask? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think the president... <laughs> I'm not going to share. <laughs> Fair enough. Next question. I'm with the class of beauty, art, and religion. And the question we had was, is kneeling the most productive means to bring about a more just society? And, and I'll, I'll add on that, is any ideas or alternatives that you guys have that might have been as productive or effective as uh, this protest? Action is always way more productive than any protest, you know. I mean, you can protest all day long. You have every right to. You can bring awareness to stuff, you know. But awareness doesn't solve the problem. So for me, I was always very firm with anybody that I talked to on this issue. I had a lot of players reach out and ask me, about, you know, teams asked me about, like, the, the Seahawks consulted me on that, the linking arms thing. Like, did they think that was not offensive, you know, or whatever? And I'm like, I don't really care. And a lot of veterans don't really care that much. It doesn't – it's not what – so much what the uh, what the action is or what – excuse me, that's a bad way to put it – what the gesture is of protest. If there's action behind it and it's – to me, it's positive and you're doing what you can – um, to improve a situation, and, and you really are a part of that movement, then that's what's important way beyond um, the protest itself, you know. Uh, and, and a lot of players are doing a lot of amazing things. Jackie was sharing a, a list with me earlier about the players that are still, you know, demonstrating. And, like, Kenny Stills is a great example. He plays for the Miami Dolphins. He's this, got this project where he's bringing police officers in the Miami area and, he's, you know, a lot of these kids and some of these – tougher neighborhoods um, together and developing those relationships and interactions so that both parties understand, you know, that we're all just human beings. You know, we all want the same things for the most part. And um, the more we bring each other together and create that unity, what we're supposed to be all about, um, that's how you really make a difference, you know. And, and unfortunately, a lot of times the, that doesn't get covered like it should, you know. Um, 
because it's not divisive or it's not controversial. It's awesome. <laughs> you know, it's a great story. And I wish more of that. Uh, well, a lot of that's probably happening that I don't even know about. So like that's, I think that's more important. And, and if kneeling or whatever demonstration you choose gives you an opportunity and a platform to share about that stuff, I think I want to see more of that. You know, when, when somebody's asked you a question about why did you kneel today or why blah, 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 or, you know, you can talk, you can answer any way you want, you know, and I, I, I think, I think more of these players should, you know, maybe it's bragging. I don't know, but share about the work that they're actually doing. Cause a lot of them are doing a lot of really important work and, and we're not hearing about it. You know, but Nate, if I could just follow up on that, you did urge, did you not Colin to kneel rather than sit? So you thought there was some yeah. intrinsic correct difference because for me, gym. and this is just my, that was just my opinion, you know, it's purely my opinion, but I think in times of crisis or, or, or whatever you want to call it, in my opinion, the last thing, you know, a hero does is sit it out to me. You know, I want somebody, um, that's going to stand for something, you know? And in this case, I thought being around his teammates was the most important thing, not isolating on the bench for me. I said, I think you should be next to those guys on your team. Cause a lot of them do agree with you. And a lot of them, whether they, even if they disagree with you, they support what you're doing and what you're saying. Um, so get next to those guys, embrace them, you know. And it was really interesting after that, actually that night when he did take take it, you know, he decided to to take a knee alongside his teammates. He stood up and like all these guys on his team are coming up to him and you know dapping him up and giving him hugs and all this stuff. And it was like he wasn't radioactive anymore. No, and yeah. it, it grew through the year, and he was voted team captain, you know, by his teammates. Like he was. They, they voted him as, you know, the uh, the leader of the team at the end of the season. And I'm not saying it's because he was taking a knee, but I think, I think you know, being along – the most important thing to me more than the kneeling was that he was alongside his teammates, you know, alongside his brothers in arms or whatever you want to call it. Um, and that they understood that he cared about this, but he cared about them too. And it wasn't about him, you know. It was about uh, the message, so yeah. – I think that's team why um, ahead, Bill I'm Russell's sorry. enduring image of him kneeling with that Presidential Medal of Freedom around his neck, a man who really at this point has kind of in difficult health, kneeling for, you know, he joked with me afterwards, the kneel took 20, 20 minutes to get <laughs> down and probably another 20 to get back up. But there was something about that image I think that he felt was uh, showing some solidarity to these, to these NFL players. Yeah. And, you know, protesting is one tool but it's certainly not the only tool that can be used to get at the heart of uh, moving us toward justice. And um, I, I think we, you know, we we see this issue come up, and it all of a sudden, that's the only thing we can talk about. Right. And in the grand scheme of the tools available, kneeling is a relatively, and I don't say this to denigrate what they do, but a relatively minor one. You know, getting people to the polls to vote, mm -hmm. that's a big tool. That's like a sledgehammer. That's interesting. Um, you make the point of having, um, you know, being involved in working with law enforcement and young people, bringing them together. That's a pretty big tool. But, um, you know, we have to use all the tools available. And certainly there's nothing wrong with using the protest tool, but that can't be the only one. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of police officers that I've spoken to through this whole time that you know, were in the military that have reached out, and most of them um, very positive on this thing. I've had very, very few that have said, like, you know, they're upset about this stuff. They, want thing, they see those same things. And when, you know, when these mistakes are made within their – Ranks, they hate it, you know. Like I, I kind of talked about that earlier, but right, uh, the socks thing. That I, I was at a, yeah. a barbecue with police officers and firefighters, right after this happened, and the socks 
just really bothered them. Yeah. And, it, and it, I think it minimized Colin's message a little bit. And um, did he ever come out and say, I wish I hadn't done that? I wish he had just done that. And voted. Right, and voted would have been good, too. <laughs> you, youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> Next question. I'm going to steal that from my kids. <laughs> Uh, You'll understand that when you're a little older. Right there. <laughs> yep. Um, hi, I'm from the sorry, um, the Intro to Race and Ethnic Studies um, class. Um, so there's a couple of things, um, and I'd like to acknowledge the fact that Colin has kind of created this creative tension to raise awareness and to have conversations and possibly further, you know, um, activity towards addressing equality in the United States. But my major question is, will the United States ever reach a point of reconciliation when Americans are more concerned about the disruption to their favorite pastime and entertainment than, than focusing on the issues of oppression um, that are faced by minority groups? Um, and I'm speaking as a person that is not American, that therefore addressing it as an American problem. I mean, I think we will. I, th I think our, in our history, we've, We've made a lot of mistakes <laughs> in the American, you know, in our short American history. We've made a lot of mistakes, but most of those we have done what we can, I think, to 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 address them and to fix them and to move forward. And we still have a long way to go. We do, but it's important to acknowledge that we have come uh, certainly, you know, a great ways. And I think I don't know how long it's going to take, but I I believe in us enough that I think it will. It's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be a-holes. I'll watch my language a little bit here. In every subculture, there's just bad people, and that's never going to go away. But I think the more, you know, like you said, it's a very important conversation that Colin started, really, um, or at least brought back up. And as we continue to have those, and, and I think sometimes things have to break down a little bit before they can re rebuild, you know. Um, and maybe we're just in the breaking down stage right now. I've, I've got that hope, and and I think it's I think it's absolutely possible, and I believe that I mean otherwise what are you fighting for you know, so we we have this schizophrenic personality. On the one hand, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, and at the same time, those words were written. The people that wrote them owned slaves. Bound up in everything we've done as a country, up to and including abolishing slavery, but bound up in all of that is that history. And until we address what I will call the present effects of that history. We are bound to sort of make progress in fits and starts, slip backwards in fits and starts, but never uh, get to that true promise that um, at least verbally we have committed to as a country. Racial inequality remains the elephant in America's big room. Absolutely. And uh, I loved talking with a lot of you today when I was here. Um, I have a 25-year-old daughter and a 21-year-old son, and they appear colorblind to me. And I just feel like with each generation, and your, it's your turn now, make our country colorblind. Make our country colorblind. I know it's easy for me to say. Make it colorblind, but don't fall into the trap that um, making bias harder to detect is the same as making it go away, because it's not. He's so smart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Next question. There's a question there. Hello. Okay. Uh, I'm with the American Politics 
course here on campus. And my question was, uh, when did we see the rise of politics integrate into sporting events? Um, as far as awareness, protest, and statements go in the political sphere, and where do you see it going in the next 5, 10, to 20 years? Uh, so some background, like as we saw with the NBA, will we see something similar to that with things like the MLB and uh, the NFL? I, I don't know. I, I think sport has been um, <laughs> from day a backdrop. W- from for, day one. Right. Um, so I, I'm, I'm in the middle of a project that involved, uh, that involved me, again, talking with Bill Russell for quite a while. And uh, you guys are probably too young, most of you, to know this, but in the 1950s and 60s, there was a racial quota in the NBA. It started out you could only have one African-American player. And then they were nice enough because they realized, wow, these guys are pretty good. Maybe we'll have two. And then it went up to three. And uh, just think about that now. So you're African-American, and you're better than seven of those guys, but because of the color of your skin, you're going to get cut, and I'm going to make the team. And so Bill Russell saw enough of this, and somebody asked about it, and he said, well, it sure looks like a racial quota to me. If it isn't, you can find me, you can throw me out of the league, or you can prove to me it's not. He got a call from the commissioner, Walter Kennedy, who said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he said, what are you doing? If I'm wrong, go ahead, find me, throw me off the team. But you know I'm not wrong because you have a racial quota. So this is the 1950s. Remember the uh, 68 Olympics, right? Carlos Rogers. So uh, I think sports, you know, people like to call it the toy store. I get that. I make my living in the toy store. But I also think that sports, because it means so much to so many of us, it's a wonderful place to affect social change. And I think people like Bill Russell, maybe someday Colin Kaepernick, it's going to be interesting to see how history views him. Uh, LeBron James, I think, has done some wonderful things. I I mean, Arthur Ashe, I could name a lot of African-Americans. Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson, of course. Uh, They've affected social change in a way that sometimes the everyday people in our world cannot. Just by playing. Tiger Woods. <laughs> and by, by rising above, by rising above, um, I mean, the stories, this, this, again, this project I've been working on, the stories of racial discrimination would put your hair on and the things that, um, and I'm sure you have stories of your own. Well, the... I'm putting words in your mouth <laughs> again, sorry. <laughs> um, when I was playing football, when I started playing football, uh, in high school, um, there were well in, in the in the states that made up the Confederacy, there were no African American football players in college unless they were on an all black team. Hmm. One of the historical historically hmm. black colleges and universities. Like Grambling, right? Grambling Southern, 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 yeah. But Alabama. No. Mississippi? No. Tennessee? No. South Carolina? No. North Carolina? No. Hmm. Georgia? No. Kentucky probably no. Kentucky? No. I mean, we could go on forever. And that's just the way things were back then. That's the, that's the reality. We forgot to mention and, Jesse Owens, too. I'm just and, thinking of Jesse Owens, right? Absolutely. Jim Thorpe. Another Jim question? Hi, I'm uh, Dakota. Um, I'm in the uh, race and politics class. Um, and my question was, how much, um, how much do you see race um, affecting the reaction, like the reaction of Colin Kaepernick's um, choice versus um, his talent? Like, would you say that uh, an equally talented player of a different race would have came off better? or perhaps even uh, a more renowned uh, black athlete like uh, Larry Fitzgerald or someone? 
That's an interesting question, isn't it? So if Larry Fitzgerald, what you're what you're saying, so I can understand, if Larry Fitzgerald had this same position, how would it be viewed? Right, right. We don't have to choose Larry Fitzgerald. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Cam, or I don't know, not Cam Newton. I'm trying to think of a who who's a guy in the league that's obviously one of the one of the one of the greats, but that everybody really looks up to and really respects. The question is. Had it been Tom Brady? We're, or, no, I think you mean, Tom a Brady, you're you mean a prominent African-American. Yeah, I do you? mean a prominent well, African-American first. Forget about the African-American. If Tom Brady had done the same thing, what would happen? Yeah. I don't think it would have the same effect. I would faint dead away because he's so apapolitical. <laughs> well. <laughs> no, he uh, is on purpose. Uh, assuming I, I Except get he voted all for that. Trump. Right. But if the question is... Is race an issue here, or is it simply a question of politics? Hmm. If Tom Brady had done the same thing, what would have happened? I don't know the answer. I think it's certainly, well, I do know uh, that. I, I, I have some ideas, but. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, but it's like keeping, to me, on the opposite side of things, in, in a negative way. I mean, some of these guys that are in the league that are hitting women, you know, uh, because... S same same thing. Right. They're, you same, know... Same, same. They're uh, the ones that are in a lot of, I guess, management's eyes or whatever, so good that it doesn't matter, you know, and that for some reason that's able to be swept under the rug and the fans will get over that quick. But they do. That's the yeah, problem. I know. It's a huge problem. Because everybody, the Dallas Cowboy fans were were thrilled oh, when Greg Hardy free, got well, signed. What about the Zeke stuff? And I know it's, you know, there's a question there of what, you exactly. know, the innocence or whatever, but everyone was on this free Zeke train. And I was like, guys, mm -hmm. if he's been accused five times, I mean, I don't know if he's guilty, but like, let's take a step. Let's wait till we, like, as, as Justice Page would say, let's wait till we see the facts here. You right. know, just because you want your running back to play and you're worried about the play. I mean, come on. What's more important here, you know? In, in our lives. But your point about Tom Brady being above reproach, which is, I think, what... I don't want to put... Where I keep putting words in your mouth. No, not, not above reproach, but... If the question is, is race an issue, what happens when you put Tom Brady in Colin Kaepernick's shoes? You're right. It is different. Of course it's different. You're right. Wouldn't it be nice if Tom Brady had actually been the one that uh, tried to raise... I'm not picking on Tom Brady, but if a prominent white player was the one that said we got to stop racial in inequality, does it have does it have the same? Um, that was my question, kind of. Would it have the same effect? I, I don't know. I think it would be very powerful because he could galvanize everybody, and that's interesting. So we got to find a really prominent white NFL <laughs> player to. I mean, he's definitely he's actually supported. Um, what Colin's doing, you know, as far as his rights, you know. Oh, and, of course. And yeah. then people like Chris but Long a, have gone a step further than that, you yeah. know, and advocated. Um, Who's Chris? Chris Long's donating his entire salary to what? Which charity? Uh, it's for uh, under. I don't know the name of the charity, but yeah. it's it's, uh, it's his for, entire it's salary. Individual, He's a wonderful like, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, under underprivileged kids and yeah. it's ed, ed, education program. Very good question. Very good question. It's a really hard one. Thank you. Next question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. We're bartering. I'm bartering you for that jacket. We're going to talk <laughs> later. Um, so my name is Miguel. Um, I'm for the uh, Religion 225 class of God, Suffering, and Horrendous Evils. Um, so something we discussed is symbols. Um, and we, 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 we mentioned how the flag is a symbol, but it's a different symbol for, for, for everyone. Um, for myself, uh, personally, um, I'd be the fourth straight generation if I went military. So the flag has a different meaning to me than most people do. Um, so what w we wondered was if Colin Kaepernick decided not to do this with the, with the American flag, with the national anthem, would, he, would his protest, would his movement still have the same effect? Or, no. or is there anything that could be equal, I guess, in a way to... The national anthem, the American flag. I don't think so. I mean, at least at the setting of a sporting event, you know, 
the the whole purpose as Doug Baldwin states over and over. Doug Baldwin plays for the Seattle Seahawks. Extremely eloquent guy on all this stuff, and is you know. Um, I'm I'm going to say this yeah, again. Go ahead. In, in in this context, if he hadn't protested during the flag during the national anthem, it wouldn't have drawn as much attention, and therefore we wouldn't be having this conversation. But that protest really isn't what it's about. I mean, the question is, what are we going to do about justice? What are we going to do about injustice? And we can, I mean, one of the things this controversy has done is gave us an excuse not to talk about justice. Hmm. And it uh, strikes me that had he protested in some other way, we'd be in the same place. We wouldn't because be, we'd just be ignoring it, you mean? We, because we'd just be ignoring it. Another good question. You guys have good questions. Um, Hi. Uh, I'm in the music and social justice class, um, and I appreciate, um, Mr. Boyer, that you brought up the history of the National Anthem and kind of going off of what Justice Page said about um, the history of America just kind of being stained with racial discrimination, specifically the text of the Star Spangled Banner written by a slave owner, set to a melody written by a British guy, um, and the third verse specifically references slavery. Um, and aside from the fact that it's not a very accessible melody to sing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Now there's a controversy. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think are the implications of having such a racially charged national anthem? Oh, I thought she was asking you. Specifically. Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the Constitution classifies slaves as three-fifths of a person. Having a national anthem that's racially charged doesn't seem so out of place given that. It's funny how so many things that we just take for granted, and I think we would all agree. Um, I, for instance, did not know the third verse of the, na of the Star Spangled Banner. Do any of us? Well, it's a good, this, uh, this very I mean, intelligent young lady does. We don't sing those for a reason now, at least. But right. you know, but but I think the point is, was, yeah. how many things over time um, lose lose their they're no longer. Poli I mean, we should not be calling the Washington football team the Redskins anymore either. But that's that's all the overflow room. So there's a lot of things that I think over time um, we we become de almost desensitized to them. I would say that would be my answer. You don't even realize. Unaware. Unaware I mean, is totally a better word. unaware. One. Yep. I mean, what's we? I was just. Are there any of the journalism students here that I spoke with earlier today? They had a little article about uh, at Christmas time. Uh, sand. You know. Hey, what's in that drink? You know that song. Baby, it's cold outside. Hey, what's in that drink? She's like. He's like putting something in her drink. That's okay. We sing that. Didn't your parents used to sing that when they were decorating the tree? My goodness. It's just another, I'm, I'm, I'm off the track, but it's just an example of um, things that are just aren't, we're unaware or we don't pay enough attention. What's in that drink? I mean, really? Question here? Can I ask? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Um, is it really our job to Monday morning quarterback tell the oppressor, the oppressive, tell the oppressed how to protest um, their oppression? Um, and then would the protesters even want to at this point since the form of protest has kind of become part of the protest and has gained so much um, momentum to the movement? I mean, I guess the answer to that question is no. You, you you don't tell the oppressed how to to protest, but you also you don't get to choose how people perceive it as a protester. That's right. 
you know, and that's not up to you. It's not, you, you, you can say all day that it's about this and it's not about that. And unfortunately, um, p- people will all receive, every single individual is going to re- perceive that differently and take that differently. I mean, that's just, that's the reality of that. You, you, the most important thing you can do is continue to push your message and why you're doing what you're doing, I think. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you, you, you can't, just like you shouldn't tell someone they have to do, I mean, you shouldn't tell someone you have to do anything in this country. You know, I, you shouldn't tell them, in my opinion, I, I want I want people to to stand for the anthem because they want to, because they feel the way I feel about this country, which I think is a pretty damn great place. Um, that is not perfect by any means. <laughs> but um, compared to a lot of the places that I've been in my life, uh it's it's pretty incredible uh, what we have here and the freedoms that we do um, that we do have as compared to some other places. So, uh, but at the same time, yeah, I, the, you never get to achieve, you never get to choose how people perceive anything. I agree. Far be it for me to tell people how to run their lives, except to the extent that they run afoul of the law in some dramatic way. have time maybe for a couple of more questions. I think this person here has had her hand up for a bit. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jessica, um, and I'm part of the Race and Social course, um, Race and Social Justice course um, with Katherine Swanson. And in my question I want to ask, um, do you see the media normalizing um, white supremacy, and, uh, um, and in what ways? Um, so I read your article on the Dear Every American, and in what ways, if at all, do you see if your article normalizes white supremacy at all? Though I know that um, that's a very, very critique. I didn't even critique. address white supremacy. Like, what do you mean? What part or, or um, specifically? And by mean? white supremacy, I mean um, basically putting Colin in his place. And I know that it's it's not... I know I'm getting some heat right now. No, no, I just want to know what, how, how, how do you, just uh, pure curiosity, how do you think I was saying in any way that I'm putting Cohen in this place? I feel that, okay, because in my personal opinion, I mm-hmm. feel that what Colin did was valid. And though you share the story of um, the history of the Star Spangled Banner and mm-hmm. why people started standing up for it, I still didn't even, I didn't even know that. And so thank you for educating me on that. But going back to what Colin stood up for was against police brutality. Mm-hmm. And that's the heart of the issue is the heart of racism there. And uh, that's what we should be addressing. And I think that's what we've digressed from. Totally. Um, and, uh, and some, like when I was reading your article, um, I respect the service that you gave for our country. And, um, but to speak with Colin and, uh, for him, I don't know what's going on with him personally, but how is he feeling in regards to all of this? And um, I just see that the media normalizes white supremacy by putting Colin in his place, by having all these people disagree with him. I, I disagree with that, but uh, you know, I don't think the media normalizes white supremacy at all. Um, I, 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 what have you just? What have you seen in the media that would reveal that to you? Um, well. Like, give me an example. I that question open to anyone. Have you guys seen the media normalizing white supremacy? So I think one of the problems here is white supremacy c- carries a very, very heavy negative connotation. Um, and I'm a member of the media, and uh, I think there are a lot of... I, I haven't written about Colin specifically a lot, but I've written and spoke of this issue a lot. And I think um, in many ways... We're the ones that keep saying, remember what this is about. Now, the national anthem became a whole separate runaway train, especially because in our 24 hours, seven days of ne- social news network, everything get, goes viral. But I think that uh, in many ways, the media has been a friend to Colin Kaepernick. It's the media that's pointing out, I mean, if you want to get, again, we'll get inside football um, and go back and look on all the football websites of talking about all the backup quarterbacks and their statistics compared to Colin Kaepernick's and how his are superior to 80% of the backup quarterbacks in the league, and yet here he sits without a job. So 
I think I'm going to push back a little bit on what you're suggesting. Thank you. Uh, there's a question here. Hello, my name is Aaron. Um, I was just wondering uh, on your military tours if you ever saw people protesting in, a, in any kind of similar way to Colin Kaepernick in, the, in those countries and if it had to do with their government or certain issues facing I wish countries. I had, but unfortunately a lot of those places, they would, they would probably get their head cut off for doing it, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so no, I mean, it, the level of oppression in those places, uh, is, is, is not the level of oppression we have in our country today at some point in history. I mean, I don't have that perspective, but I absolutely believe there, there you know, there was that type of stuff, but it's, it's, it's very different. You know, I, I've never seen anything like that. Um, at least where I've been from my experience. Uh, so someone else may have a different experience there, but um, it, it, it's a very it, oppressive. Doesn't even isn't even a word that I think uh, <laughs> uh, captures what some of that stuff is. You know, it's crazy because m most of the people in those places are incredibly you know beautiful, wonderful, nice people that have absolutely nothing and no voice. You know, and it's it's really it's really 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 sad and hurtful to see that and uh um that's those type of things is why i feel so appreciative to be to be here even though i think we can we and we can and we should and hopefully we will you know not see color and and grow and and continue to improve and get better but we we still got a long way to go but yeah it's it's just it's just different in in a lot of those War torn countries. Okay. We'll get to her. We'll get to her. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Hello. Um, I'm with the Narratives of Social Protest course. My name's Eli. Um, so, what we've discussed is mainly um, music, um, films, and literature and their intersection with politics. And is it the duty of someone in a position, as in an artist, to um, proclaim some sort of politics or to address um, injustice. And I feel that my question is, it, is it someone's duty, this isn't necessarily an artist, but an athlete, is their duty to address um, injustice given that they have a platform because so many people do view them and view them as um, sort of an idol and look up to them. Is it their duty to address um, racial or political injustice? I don't know if anybody has a duty, but they certainly have the right to. And I don't think anybody leaves their right to uh, protest or do anything else at the door simply because they are a celebrity or an athlete or whatever they may be. Um, I mean, athletes have views just like everybody else. But it, it's interesting, though. It's an interesting question. It brings me back to the Tom Brady um, thing. So. I covered Michael Jordan throughout his entire career, um, one of the most successful athletes of all time, who very decidedly remained apolitical, who did not take stands for, um, and made a very conscious decision not to. I would say Tiger Woods falls into that category. Uh, that doesn't make them bad people. Um, Tom Brady is one of those people. He doesn't, you know, his wife told him to stop talking about politics, so he has. Uh, I don't, <laughs> no, really, I'm not even kidding. Uh, and so these very high-profile athletes have made a decision, and I don't know that um, we're not in their shoes, so uh, literally, because Nike has a lot to do with why Michael Jordan made some of the decisions he made. I mean, it's business. But that's why I, I am encouraged by uh, LeBron James, because he does take a stand. And it's not always popular, and it's probably not al always financially savvy to do so. And so I always appreciate it when players of that magnitude do take a stand. And, uh, and I, LeBron is a little savvier about, about it than Colin Kaepernick was. And he has a whole team around him and some major endorsements uh, to that effect. But uh, I wish more athletes would. 
use their influence because again what we're all talking about is action instead of protest and uh the more i think about this tom brady thing you know if he had sent out a call to action there's probably every single citizen in new england that would follow him and uh true and maybe that would be true about lebron in cleveland and maybe that would be true about i don't know um mike trout maybe that would be true I don't know. I mean, name any any great athlete in any sport, and uh, but you can't make them, right? You have to. Some of them don't even maybe. Some of them might not even feel educated enough about the issues to do that. Because it. So the worst thing you can do is pretend you know when you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. I. Uh, yeah, I mean, people talk all the time about this idea of you know players should stick to sports, you know. But I always think that if if anybody in our country stuck to their occupation, this would be a boring, boring country. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't want to live in a place like that. Um, but more than, I guess, protest, I like the word activism, you know, because it requires some sort of an action besides just contention, I think. And, uh, but yeah, I wish more did. And I think more will. That's one thing Colin has definitely done. I don't think Chris Long donates all his paychecks paychecks this year without the, I know he doesn't you know he's, he's a great guy I know him well but that set in motion a lot of things all these players getting involved was through that you know and uh and I just hope it continues to snowball uh, as far as activism goes and and we we see more and more of that with various causes you know with veteran causes there are a lot of veteran issues out there veterans have protested a lot of things over time you know and everyone says oh well, they have a right to because they serve their country well, I served, I, I volunteered to do that, right? I made a choice, but just because somebody else doesn't doesn't mean they have any less rights than I do. I'm not owed anything above that, you know. I appreciate the gratitude, but I fought so that we all can do that, you know. That we all can take action and change the world, you know. And that's that's what we should be doing. We all have that power. I think we have time for one more question. Um, mine is more of a, maybe a, if I'm the last one, more of like a closing remark and a bit of an open-ended question of personal opinion for you guys. Like Eli, I'm on the Narratives for Social Protest class. It's an English class. And um, we actually discussed this topic today in class. And we ended up saying how it feels uh, more and more than in this world, communication ends up being more of a debate where there are two sides and we listen for the sake of replying. And there's not a lot of wanting to understand. And um, I feel like at the beginning of this whole incident, um, that's what it was. It was just a debate. A lot of people were standing their ground and um, didn't really care about understanding. So I really appreciate what you guys have done because that's what I like about panels more than debates, that we get to actually listen to each other and see where everybody's coming from. So. My open-ended question is, have you changed your stance since this whole incident started, or has it changed in this discussion right now? And then as a remark, um, as an open, or I'm not American, as a disclaimer. So as an international student, I see a lot of the times that whatever, whenever we ask Americans about something they may feel passionate about, that doesn't apply to other countries. They always compare themselves to countries that aren't doing worse than them instead of comparing themselves to countries that are doing better in order to improve. And I feel like, I just want to leave out that I'm not saying everybody does this, but a lot of the times it feels like, um, it's like, well, we are, we are doing better at this or we have better education or we have better infrastructure instead of saying, oh, Look at Norway, we could improve on our social justice issues. Or look at Finland, their education's doing slightly better than ours. Um, so do you think, uh, as Americans, is that maybe how you see yourself going to comparison-wise? I know you're looking at me, I'm not saying just you, but this happens a lot of the time, and I think as international students, we notice it a lot more when, and I, and I saw you guys nodding, and, and we're like, yeah, I mean, just uh, what I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, I mean, I, I, uh, 
I will say that I don't think Norway and Finland have nearly the diversity that we have here, um, and that's what make thing makes things sometimes difficult. Um, we do, despite immigration policies and all that and all that stuff, we do take a lot of people into this country, and that's what it's always. I mean, this country's founded on immigrants, and that's what we all are. Um, but yeah, I mean, I when I say I think we're a great we're a great place. I think what we what we're supposed to represent and what we're supposed to stand for and what you know this beacon of hope that we are to a lot of places, um, and we're we're definitely the most powerful. Uh, but w we should be working to improve all of those things. You know, we, we need we need better teachers and we need better police officers, people that are willing to do those jobs to improve those situations. You know, good people doing that. So we definitely need that. What was your real quick? What was your question? Oh, right. Um, yeah, my, 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 it's changed a lot. I mean, I've learned a lot over the last year and a half. I never, I'm not a political person. I've never, not that I don't care. I just, for a long time, I mean, it, it frustrates me because when I look at a presidential debate, we don't have, like you just said, great point. We don't have presidential panels where they just have a conversation ever. It's everybody waiting for their turn to speak, you know, and to prove their point and just to be right. Everyone's so focused on, I'm right, how can I prove that? I don't care what you have to say, like, I'm, this is my opinion, you know, and this is where we're at right now as a country. It's like, every issue, it's, are you red or blue, you know? It's not, do you have your own opinion anymore? And uh, it's frustrating, because I don't think we're gonna get anywhere with that mindset. I think we're gonna keep spinning our wheels um, when, when people aren't, to actually acknowledge and listen. So um, I've, I've grown a lot. I still got a long way to go. I still make a lot of mistakes every day. Um, but I have learned a lot. It's opened my eyes to a lot of things. And, uh, and that's even after you know, deploying to all these crazy countries and playing football and mostly you know, African-American football teams and all these things that I wasn't ex exposed to before. Even after all that, this last year and a half has probably changed me even more. Um, because of, you know, everything going on. It definitely affected me uh, more and more. I have to say my, my stance has also changed because my initial reaction to Colin was, oh, don't do that. And through, I did some reporting on it. I read, I, we, we have never met before today. I found it to be very interesting, your letter. I wasn't sure what it was all about, and over time, uh, I think the one thing that I that and I don't know why this should not surprise me. Um, I just I, I I guess I keep hoping that we're going in the right direction in terms of uh, racial equality. I, I just really want to believe that, and uh, I think sometimes I want to believe it so much I'm not realizing how far we still have to go, and so that's another. Um, wake up call for me who ne has never had to walk in the shoes of an African American in this country. Um, and I think it, all, all this debate and discussion and um, reporting that I've done on this and talking with, with athletes, lots and lots of athletes, um, a lot of the Patriot players, um, and realizing oh, we're just, we're not as, we're just not getting there. And so, uh, a little eye-opening for me, probably more than me changing my stance, just a little more eye-opening. And I don't know that I had a stance to begin with on this particular issue. You know, there there's lots of things going on in the world, and in the terms of relative importance, this is not, for me, at the top of the list, um, although it touches on something that's at the top of the list for me. Right. You know, I think the, the, the key is listening, is when you listen, you learn. Hard to, hard to learn when you're talking, but when you listen, you learn, and the more information you have, the better you are, the better uh, you're able to understand what the issues are and how to respond to them. One of the things that was great about serving on the Minnesota Supreme Court was that there were seven of us, 
and we didn't always agree. But even when we disagreed, having listened to what everybody else had to say, those who I disagreed with, and quite frankly, the ones I'd agree with, their perspective was a little different than mine, made what I did and what I thought better. And I think that's just the natural order of things. And so um, I, I, I hope that, as I suggested before, that we spend more time listening to each other and less time yelling at each other. And can I put in a shameless commercial? Go ahead. There is an exhibit at the Minneapolis Central Library. It's titled Testify. At Americana from Slavery to the Day from the collection of Diane and Alan Page. It is, um, will be there through the 6th of February. So if you get a chance, I would encourage you to see it. It has items and artifacts of oppression from the era of slavery from Jim Crow it also has items of expression showing the um, wonderful, warm, cultural side of the Afri African American experience. For those of you who um, need some context or want some context for what Colin Kaepernick chose to do. I think the exhibit, not because it's from our collection, but the items in the exhibit will help you understand why someone might take the steps that he took, might take the actions that he took. Um, and so it's only 50 about 50 miles to the Central Library. But if you have the opportunity, I would uh, strongly encourage you to, to see it. Thank you, Justice Page, for that wonderful suggestion. And thank you, panel, for a remarkable conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Good night.